Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation here on the Tattooed Historian's Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter channels. So glad that you are all here with us. Really looking forward to tonight's presentation. My name is John. I am the Tattooed Historian. If this is your first time, welcome in. Hope you have a great time in chat with some of your fellow history nerds, and we can all hang out here together and have a great evening. Uh, tonight, we have Brian Cheeseboro with us. Brian, good evening. Good evening, John. How you doing? Good, man. Good, man. I hope you're doing well. Uh, Brian works for the National Archives with the records of the Civil War. He's a reenactor with Company B, 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. He's been featured on American Battlefield Trust's Zoom Goes the History series and their Antietam Live programs. He's written for the Emerging Civil War blog. His presentations to the Rock Creek D.C. Civil War Roundtable include Outside of Lincoln's White House, Civil War Men and Women of the D.C. Metro Area, the Grand Reviews of the Civil War, and the First United States Colored Infantry. He is also a board member of the Alliance to Preserve the Civil War Defenses of Washington. Again, Brian, thank you so much for being here. Our, our topic tonight is uh, volunteer substitutes and drafted men enlistments during the Civil War. And I think this is a subject which is really awesome to cover because a lot of people take these kind of things for granted. Uh, have you have you experienced that when you talk to people about this kind of a topic? Um, you know, I, I, I'd say yes to that. Um, I, I think it's something that, yeah, a lot of people really don't spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, and I think even for the uh, people of the Civil War generation themselves, um, or really other wars beyond the Civil War, um, the only soldiers that are really remembered are the volunteers. Mm. Um, you know, you can you, there's a draft in, in World War I, there's a draft in World War II, uh, Korea, Vietnam, all that. But the only soldiers that really get remembered in history are those who signed up because they wanted to. Mm. And uh, and the Civil War is, is part of that as well. What sparked your interest in history in general, Brian? When did it all start? I, I don't have a starting point on when I got interested in history. Um, I've, ever since I can remember, I've just been fascinated by it, been drawn to it. Uh, if I could uh, put it in a few words, uh, as a kid, um, I saw so many black and white photos in history books. And, you know, growing up when I did um, back in the 70s and all in the 80s, um, I saw a lot of old black and white TV shows from like the 60s and things like that. At some point before I was 10, I recall asking my mom, when did the world turn into color? Uh, I had no idea there was any such thing as a black and white photograph. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it just, that's all I can really say. I, I, I don't really have a, a teacher or a date or anything. Oh my gosh, this is so incredible. It's just always been there. That's neat. That's neat. That, that happens for some people, right? They're just, it just happens and that's it. And they're, they're in the history field and, and doing their own thing. Uh, what's what's it been like for you to do the presentations for uh, the D.C. metro area Civil War Roundtable and others? Has it, What's the experience been like for you with some of the topics that you've covered, which is kind of like local history to them? Um, it's been pretty good. As a matter of fact, yesterday uh, I gave, again, my presentation outside of Lincoln's White House, uh, but this one was to a new venue. It was to a uh, nursing home or retirement mm -hmm. home or whatever. And um, uh, I'd never been there before. It was in um, Fairfax, Virginia. Um, and a few people came um, and uh, it was great. And uh, I have to give a shout out to technology and to my wife because uh, I packed everything, but I forgot my thumb drive. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm like, how do I do this? So I, I called my wife who works from home uh, and I said, honey, um, I need your help. So uh, she found my thumb drive. It was easy to find. I knew where it was uh, since I didn't have it. And um, thanks to wetransfer.com, and I guess I'm endorsing that. Nice. Uh, yeah. She was able to uh, send me the file. I was able to download it and 
there you go. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I can't think of anything worse <laughs> for a presenter than, oh my gosh, I don't have anything. I got to do hand puppets or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a pretty major thing. That's, <laughs> that's like, oh, okay, now I got to improvise and adapt. You know, that's right. That's right. There was a, there was a florist afterwards, and I made sure to bring flowers home. So, there you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome uh yeah i've forgotten like cables and yeah. stuff to hook stuff up so i understand that or a microphone dies and not having batteries so yeah we've we've been there but that's that's yeah that, that flash drive thing has happened before too so yeah uh when when we talk about uh civil war and lesbets brian and we talk about the volunteers like you said they seem to get a lot of the uh notoriety uh, as compared to the draftees, at least until like the Vietnam era, we hear a lot about draftees in the Vietnam era more so than any other place. Uh, yeah. Why do you think that is with the volunteers getting the most or the majority of the, the press, if you will, in the post-war era? I, I, I think it's um, because, well, most wars, at least, uh, I'm not going to count Vietnam in this case, but... Um, mm -hmm. Certainly, the, the overwhelming number of, of, of people in the Civil War were those who did volunteer. And I don't certainly mean to diminish the volunteer, um, but, uh, and, but I, I know that um, this country has long had a tradition, I think, of kind of that Minuteman service of, you know, you uh, hands on the plow, you know, my country needs me, and then, you know, rush to enlist. Um, defeat the enemy and be back home next week. Uh, <laughs> I mean, everything can't be the Spanish American war, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, but, uh, uh, and, and I think really with cases of men being drafted, um, it is, it's been a necessity. There's no question. Um, you know, but I guess it just doesn't feel as patriotic. Um, you know, the idea of, forcing someone to serve. Uh, and we'll certainly, I guess, get into, you know, uh, with the Confederacy uh, beginning the first draft, um, which, you know, many men saw certainly akin to enslavement. And that's the last thing they wanted to be compared to. Even for those volunteers that enlisted, uh, you know, those men really didn't, were uncomfortable with being told what to do by officers because even that uh, smacked of, of enslavement in many ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With that early group of men who who joined up and enlisted, there had to be throughout your research and others as well. Uh, there had to be hundreds of reasons why uh, why to why to join up on both sides. Uh, in, in that case, because they're volunteering for so many reasons, whether it's in their area, right? You know, it, it could be peer pressure, or it could be other things. Uh, as we move forward, that kind of decreases, I would think, you know, the, the reasoning. Um, that is, uh, I'm not sure how to really address that one because I, well, I, I know, especially with the Civil War, um, so many of us are stuck on the whole cause of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, there's no question in my mind, um, and I just usually answer that as, um, had there been no slavery, had there been no slavery, had no black person ever, Af person of African descent ever set foot in the United States, uh, no, I wouldn't be here, I guess. Uh, would there, I don't think there would have been a civil war. Um, but, and, and I know I've heard it before where, okay, sure, we can say that, that slavery caused the war, but then why did somebody fight? And if that's what you mean, you know, yes, what would cause someone to enlist? What would cause someone to say, I'm going to interrupt my life um, and then go do something else? Um, yeah, that is a question, I guess, with a thousand answers, sure. Um, and that's where you'd have to look at the, in, the motivation of, of Johnny Citizen to say, I'm going to leave, you know, my farm, my factory, my wife, uh, my family, and then go put on a uniform. Um, that that question, I guess, has to be answered by, again, looking, I think, at primary sources. Um, 
and that's a fair question. Sure, it is. Um, but I, but I just always think it's just with a focus on the overwhelming cause, the overwhelming issue. It wouldn't have been there. Wouldn't have been the reason to enlist at all. I think mm-hmm. had there not been that issue. Mm-hmm. Do you think when we look at enlistments such as you have and the and the process of enlisting that it it makes that idea a little bit more murky than the traditional like this is the this is the cause in which people are going and and this is the reason why they all must have enlisted it makes it kind of like a more murky substance to work through or do you think it it, it reinforces that narrative um i I'd like to muddle through an answer, I suppose. Uh, could you rephrase that? I'm, I'm yeah, really yeah, like, to... yeah. We have we have these uh, general generalities, if you will, that we that we we kind of generalize everything now to make things easier, and that's kind of sure. t- that's tough to do in the history field because you know you're like, okay, we we can make a generalization, but at the same time, we have to go down to when you're when you're talking enlistments and volunteers, we have to go down to the root level of the regiment, the company, stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. Does that make the idea of why this company was formed, does that make that a little bit different than just looking at the general idea, the general scope of the army, if you will? Like what, you know, like someone who someone who signed up for the Irvin McDowell's army, mm-hmm. uh, they may not have cared about Virginia that much even though they're going into Virginia and trying to win the field in Virginia, and they may not have cared so much about that, but their ideas kind of, uh, you know, went along with the idea because it was for that general scope, you know, or is it, or is it this heady idea of patriotism and, and uh, preservation of what they thought the union was, or was it something just personal to them? Oh, okay, I think I, I think I understand better. Um, you know, and, and I guess that goes kind of the, to the heart of what I've um, just been learning. And I and by the way, I'm still learning about this. I'm I'm not. I don't know that I'm I'm not a scholar on this. On this <laughs> All subject. of us are constantly learning. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. You know, uh, and I think a good historian um, is someone who is, you know, just continuing to look at um, the subject matter and reevaluate mm-hmm. that. Um, I I think definitely the man who enlists in 1861, in many ways, I think is different than the man who enlists in, say, 1864. Um, You could even, I guess, say that about about each each side, each case. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, after Sumter, there's that war fever um, and the sincere belief by many that the war isn't going to last that long. Um, and again, the volunteer. Mm-hmm. Everyone who enlists in 1861 is a volunteer, 100% volunteerism. Um, however, I did discover that uh, later in the year uh, that there were um, volunteers, but we'll give you $100 if you sign up. Hmm. So even early on, there are hmm. bounties. Um, there was one enlistment poster I saw, which uh, promised uh, land, uh, bounty land as well. I, I I'm not really sure how that happened. The bounty land system, the bounty land system uh, from the War Department, um, I think ended in 1855 before the war. Uh, but this was a state um, state signing bonus, state bounties. I don't know. Um, but then, you know, when you get to 1864, later in, in the war, of course, you you may have men who are the draftees who really don't who didn't volunteer. Um, you may also have those substitutes, those men who uh, are basically there because of someone else. I suppose it's possible that, that a substitute, uh, or I don't know about a drafted man, but a substitute could be someone who served in 1861 with a 90-day enlistment and so on. Um, but I think really um, um, there's you know some differences uh, early on. No one really knows how this war is going to turn out. I think it's going to be short. And, and if I can just say real quick too, um, I think it's very important with all of this whole subject to remember that nobody knows how the war is going to end. Nobody knows that it's going to take four years. 
Nobody knows that it's going to be, you know, what's the latest figure they're saying now, three quarters of a million dead. Right. Nobody knows that. So um, there, there's a, in the movie called Mountain, there's a great line where uh, one of the extras or somebody says, we'll be, we'll be back in a month. You know, Confederate soldiers saying we'll be back in a month. You know, men really believe this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this, this, this is not going to take that much out of my life and we'll go defeat the enemy. They can't fight anyway. You know, we're, we're true patriots. We're true Americans. Uh, both sides, I think, really believing that they are the true heirs to the founders. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, so if, if that answers your question, I think mm -hmm. definitely as the war goes on and is shaped by the casualties, uh, where it's fought, uh, you know, which states are loyal, um, I, I think sometimes it's amazing. Think about, uh, um, and I'll wrap this up, like, for instance, if the Confederacy had never moved its capital from Montgomery to Richmond, if they'd stayed in Montgomery for the four years, the war would be completely different. Yeah. Vastly different. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think those things really shape who signs up uh, increasing of age, um, you know, uh, raising it to, to 50 for the Confederacy um, changes a lot of things. Hmm. Talk to us, Brian, about what a substitute is. Uh, some people don't know the substitute system during the American Civil War. They just know volunteers and maybe people who are drafted later on. Sometimes we forget that substitute okay. system. Talk to us about what that is, Brian. Um, all right. The substitute uh, comes about um, from the draft. I, I just got a hold of, uh, as I said, I'm still learning, and I saw uh, something of the, the draft uh, coming about for the first time in American history during the Civil War, apparently there were some substitutes before the war, and I'm not really keen on all of that. But during the Civil War with the draft, and this was not, um, well, in, in, in some cases, like for the Confederacy, it wasn't like sticking, putting on a blindfold and sticking your hand in a big jar or something like that. You know, um, all men 18 to 35 were drafted essentially in the Confederacy, uh, or all white men, because uh, that's what that's what for, first conscription act said. Right. Uh, for the for the Union, um, there were men who were selected uh, specifically for that uh, draft, and they had to serve, or you know they faced some kind of fine, uh, some kind of punishment, unless they could do do one of two things. Um, pay $300 to be exempted from uh, the draft. And I, and I recall seeing years ago uh, 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 pictures of men like, you know, Rockefeller, or Jay Gould, as young men, you know, living comfortably could all uh, afford that uh, and still put food on the table. Um, but um, others, $300 is a lot of money. So um, unless you could hire a substitute, now, as far as I know, $300 to the government. But if if I'm drafted and I say, hey, John, um, would you serve in my place? And I'll pay you $150. That would be certainly up to you if you decided that, hey, you know, I'm strapped for cash. I need the money. And you'll put yourself, of course, in harm's way. And I I'm, I'm, don't have to worry about that. Um, that's basically how the substitute system worked during the war. Mm -hmm. Finding someone to fight in your place when you were compelled by the draft to serve. Mm. There's a, a good question here in the, in the comments, and I would love to bring this up here because since you work at National Archives, you've got some understanding of archival uh, practices, holdings and stuff. Uh, is there a central clearinghouse of records where one can find out whether a given wealthy young man hired a sub or paid a sum to avoid service? I know there may be many answers to this, Brian, but uh, some ideas for someone who's looking for this kind of information would be awesome. I I haven't found one. Um, I wish to God that, and maybe there is one somewhere, but I have not seen it. Uh, that's the kind of thing I think would be on Ancestry because there's draft registrations on Ancestry and such. But is there a list of all the men who hired substitutes and with all the men who uh, substituted for them? I haven't found that. 
Um, the closest thing we found is um, within individual compiled military service records, the CMSRs that we have at the archives. Um, I found the names of in, in the the uh, the enlistment paper um, in the soldier's record, where it shows that this so this man is serving as a substitute for this other man. That's as close as I've gotten. Uh, again, I'd love to find that. Um, and one of the reasons I guess I would love to find it too is because um, uh, there was at some point some um, transracial or interracial or whatever uh, substituting going on. Oh, wow. um, where, where white men were hiring black men to substitute for them. Hmm. Uh, but I was asked before, well, was there a case where a black man hired a white man to substitute for him? Uh, <laughs> haven't found it. Wouldn't be surprised if it happened. I just haven't found it yet. Yeah. That's wild. I didn't know there was a transracial uh, element to it. You know, I, I just always perceived it as, you know, uh, a white man is, is drafted. He has to find another white man for the unit since it's a segregated unit. But I, I didn't know it was, it was a numbers thing uh, involved there, too. Yeah. It, and at some point, I think the uh, the War Department did crack down and say that, no, um, they didn't want to do the the, the transracial. Uh, how much it was enforced after that, I'm not sure. Mm. Um, but um, they did it, they did take note of it and, and try to stop that. And Ted, thank you for that awesome question. We really appreciate that. Uh, Jim over on YouTube, thank you for the question. Brian, how has your work at the archives impacted your interest and understanding of the Civil War? Great question, Jim. Um, that is a good question. Um, well, uh, real quick, I started with the archives in 2007, worked at the Washington National Records Center until 2012, then worked at College Park until 2015. Um, as of 2015, I've been um, downtown DC. And um, and by the way, I just have to say a disclaimer, I guess, I, I don't speak for the archives tonight. Right. I'm speaking right. for myself and, and all that. Um, but um, it really is great to be in a place uh, where I have just that access right there to the Civil War compiled military service records, again, the CMSRs and the pension files. Um, we also have uh, the Confederate CMSRs as well. We don't have uh, pensions for Confederates because they were issued by the state. But um, things like just the other day, um, I discovered, I uh, never knew this, but um, the Battle of Fort Stevens uh, took place in Washington, D.C., July 11th and 12th, 1864. Um, only battle, Civil War battle in D.C. I'm born and raised D.C. So that battle is uh, kind of near and dear to me. Um, and just discovered uh, the other day that there was a man, a young man, Private William Lattimore of Company G, I believe, the 77th New York Infantry, who fought at Fort Stevens. And Lattimore was black or mulatto, 19th century or biracial today. Uh, again, an example of a man, of a black man in, or man of color in a white unit, which wasn't supposed to happen, but it did. Um, and now I know that I can go uh, to work. I'm, I'm going in on Thursday. We've just been going in here and there um, to go and look at his record. I can just go look it up uh, and check that out and see what it says and see my, what I might be able to find. Hmm. That's awesome. Uh, Joe Ricci over there in Franklin, Tennessee. Welcome in, buddy. Thank you. Is there any evidence to show a lack of spirit in the ranks of substitutes or draftees in the armies of 63, 65? How'd they fare with veteran enlisted men? Um, historically, yeah, historically, uh, there's always that resentment um, with the veteran having been through what they've been through. Um, I can't think of any um, situation or a story. I, I did hear one, I think, um, uh, uh, the, the new recruits, and these were um, uh, men who at least had been, uh, I know this isn't really kind of the answer, but but at least had been in the, the forts around uh, Washington City. Um, the Grant had taken out of the forts in 64 and then went to the front. And I've heard those stories about them, and maybe it's them or some other new regiments. But as they arrived in the field, um, of, of veteran 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 regiments 
uh, men making fun of them, doing things like as they're marching down the road to the battle, you know, have a blanket and then lift it up and it's a corpse and things like that, and just kind of spooking these guys. Hmm. Um, uh, one thing that was interesting, um, I know, and this is this is not, I don't think, untypical, but like in the sixth sixth United States Colored Infantry, uh, and, and again, you know, so many of the uh, the USCT or late war regiments, mid late war regiments, but the sixth United States um, Colored Infantry, uh, Company A, are all volunteers. Most of them volunteers. Um, by Company, I think L or M. 90% drafted and substitutes. And hmm. this is within the same regiment. Um, so you can definitely imagine uh, some tensions. Uh, and and I think, for, for especially for a Black regiment, um, knowing that, you know, accepting less pay or receiving less pay at the time, um, and so many of the things you can think of, um, uh, of men who... Um, I'm giving up so much and the fact that I could be enslaved or executed and I volunteered and then this other guy didn't, sure, there's going to be resentment. Hmm. Hmm. I know I just uh, read a previous work or a work that was just brought out uh, by my friend Jonathan Noyalis with the 9th New York Heavy Artillery and they're around D.C. actually and uh, in these letters and they're actually talking about getting draftees in their unit for the first time as basically, you know, guys come in and, and reinforce the unit and they've lost some numbers and they need to up their numbers again. And they're going to bring draftees in. And this guy writes in a letter, we're going to have fun with them. And right. it, must be, it must be like they're going to basically do 1860s version of hazing. Uh, mm. like, like you say, you know, scare, scare the crap out of them by doing something like uncovering a, a corpse or – or something like that to show them uh, what they're getting into or, you know, giving them the work around the camp and nobody else wants to do, you know, because of that, there must be that animosity there. Like, wow, we've been out here for two, three years and now you're showing up and you don't want to be here. and We don't want you here. Right. You know, uh, that also makes me think of um, when I did my uh, presentation um, and uh, I think everybody, who's probably listening, and you certainly uh, are familiar with the movie Gettysburg and the second mate, mm -hmm. uh, those guys who didn't want to fight. And I and I wanted to, um, when I did my presentation on the subject, um, include movies, because movies are so uh, important, I think, um, because so many people, that's where they're getting their history. Mm -hmm. Sure, I know there's a lot of movies that have a lot of things wrong. But still, as they say, more people are going to read, uh, are going to watch a film than they'll than they'll uh, uh, read a book. I, I saw Titanic. I've seen Titanic several times. I'm not going to read a book on Titanic, you know. <laughs> uh, so, um, um, but uh, uh, and it's the same with with the Civil War and all those things. Um, so, um, um, like the scene where Chamberlain speaks to those guys, the mutineers of the, of the second main. Um, and, you know, he tells them, hey, we're an army out to set other men free. And, and there were a thousand of us when we formed. And then there's less than 300 of us now and things like that. And, and he, even every time I hear that speech, um, I'm inspired by it. But uh, it really wasn't given because the timeline is very different than the actual event. Um, these were two-year enlistees of the second main uh, who were ordered home, the other men. And that is true. But that was in May, uh, late May of 1863. Um, Chamberlain was promoted to colonel on the same date, I think. And then uh, by May 23rd, and this is uh, weeks before the Battle of Gettysburg, um, the, uh, the second, those guys of the second are brought to the 20th. And Chamberlain didn't give a speech. He wrote to the governor on behalf of the second Maine. Um, and it wasn't even until uh, June 10th, about mid-June, where the Army of Northern Virginia starts to move from Culpeper. Um, and I say that last part because when Chamberlain says, I think if we lose this fight, we're going to lose the war, it, it, there was no fight. And certainly nobody knew how big it was going to be, get at the time. So it's a great movie moment. Um, but 
it's that it, the, the conflict of men who are enlisted for two years and three years within the same regiment, once again, is a real thing. Uh, and I'm not sure, it, it still is odd to me how, how the men who enlisted for longer, did you talk to any of these guys? Hey, these guys are like, hey, I'm going back home to Bangor or Portland or whatever in a couple of weeks. What about, I I'm, I'm, have another year. You know, I mean, I just don't know how that went. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, it had to be a, a salty thing to go through, you know, when a company or two has to stay behind because they, they went with three years. And, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's that has to hurt morale pretty severely. And and I never, you know, that that's a great way to point it out, Brian, is that we see it through popular history. Mm -hmm. And like you say, you know, we're going to watch a movie about something and we're never going to read a book about it. Like, like, like you with Titanic or like me with something else uh, it, it, or someone in the chat with something else. That's our only kind of thought with it and our curiosity spark with it. And then it, you wonder how that proceeds or how it actually transpired because it's just based on a true story or in the case of Gettysburg, it's an entire fiction book <laughs> made into a movie. So, yeah. Another, another example is um, uh, in Gods and Generals. Um, the other the other fiction movie uh yeah. where um um stonewall jackson when he's a saw a colonel he uh meets with the young soldier uh, private jenkins um i look for jenkins he doesn't exist um and jenkins father uh, who's a minister and um stonewall tells uh the young man um you know you're in the fourth virginia and you know if you you can leave now if you want or you can come with us, but if you come with us, you may never again leave. And those are the words he uses. Well, the reality is, is that um, the private likely would have signed on for a year. And again, nobody knows how long, what's going to happen with the war. So mm -hmm. that's all I'm saying is I really doubt that, um, and I know it's a brief moment in the movie, but being told you may never again leave before a draft, before any of that, before nobody knows how the war is going to end. I doubt he's saying that. Mm. Mm. Uh, one of the other movies which has impacted how we see enlistment service and such is my favorite Civil War movie, which is Glory. And we see that in there uh, with enlisting and and uh, what we would consider going through training and, and such. And with the 54th, it's, it's really an interesting story with enlistment, right? Because they have people going all across the northern states to try to get uh men to join the ranks it's a an enlistment drive sort of correct where they're going into pennsylvania and new york and trying to fill the ranks of that particular unit and we see it in glory but not that much yeah um that is true um there is a um a uh, chart which shows that uh, it was in military images magazine and i um uh a lot of the again by a company company a was massachusetts men um and i guess company b and whatever but as you get later on in companies k and such um they're mostly men from other states um and they did recruit all over the north and in canada and such um but i found out that that's not um unique to the 54th um hmm. uh for one thing um massachusetts um uh, each state had a quota. Each state was given a number of recruits to um, to enlist, to provide to the government. Um, and Massachusetts was one state that um, uh, sent agents all over the country um, to to recruit men credited to Massachusetts. Um, I saw I've seen the list where, um, there are USCT soldiers, and wait a minute, Massachusetts didn't have a USCT regiment. No, it didn't. They had three black regiments, 54th, 55th, and the 5th Massachusetts Colored Cavalry. Um, but that's it. Um, but there's somebody in the 38th or whatever USCT who was from Louisiana or something, um, and he enlisted, but the credit was to Massachusetts. Um so and I and I think there are other states that did this. Uh by the way, um there's only a handful of states which actually met their quota throughout the war. Massachusetts was one of them, but there's several others 
that um, didn't didn't make mm -hmm. it, um, didn't make their quotas. Uh, let me see if I can see. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that did, and I'm looking at my graph here, Ohio, Illinois, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Vermont, Rhode Island, and Kansas all met quotas. And the rest, New York, Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey, and so on, didn't make their quotas. Uh, provided mm -hmm. a lot of men, but never met their quotas. They all came up short. Wow. That's more that's more than I thought. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and and by the way, uh since you mentioned Glory, I I uh, uh I love Glory too. Absolutely great movie. Uh brought a lot of tears to my eyes and does what a movie should do. But I I've, I've I've kind of had a beef with it. Um uh, there's a lot of things that are wrong. And one of my latest beefs is um where they depict the regiment forming in November 1862. Uh, that's if you go back and check, that's when they enter Kent Reedville. Um, that's what it shows on the film, and they don't make it to the front to the front until June of 1863. No Civil War regiment spent seven months training before they went off to war. Have I looked at every single Civil War regiment? No, but it you can figure this out because <laughs> one, uh, Seven Days, Antietam, Shiloh, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, The Wilderness. All those casualties, just devastating casualties in these battles, 53,000 in Gettysburg alone. So if I'm raising a regiment um, and we've already got several hundred men, and we need these guys now. Mm -hmm. We don't need to even wait and, and many regiments took the field with even less than a thousand men. I know that's an easy number. They always say a regiment's a thousand men. There are many that were are a lot less, um, simply because they need the soldiers and certainly, you know, the Confederacy, definitely. Um, so many, many took that with a lot less. But yeah, I just, um, uh, the, the, the reality is, uh, rather than seven months, try weeks, um, 20th Maine, Chamberlain's Regiment, they were formed in, in late August, 1862. They were on the field at Antietam. Mm -hmm. They weren't actually put into battle, but they were on the field at Antietam. Right. Uh, the 16th Connecticut was formed right around the same time. They were put into battle. Um, some Pennsylvania regiments, same deal. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, a really short amount of time. And by the way, uh, for the 54th, they actually formed, I believe it was in March, started forming then. So it was uh, a couple months as opposed to um, mm -hmm. several months. Yeah, that that's really important about the about that timeline, and also when we think of like one of my ancestors was 130th PA at Antietam. They came in August 17th into service, and they're under fire September 17th. You know? Right, and they they actually wrote like the sergeant of his company wrote, "We've only fired our musket twice, and now we're and now we're getting thrown." into this fight. So yeah, it's not a, it's not a, like an advanced infantry training course to get out there like you'd have today. It's get out yeah. there now. You know? And, you know, with, with reenacting uh, that I've done it and, and I've really, uh, for me, it's been such an education um, because it's really shown me how one, how inward focused a regiment was, you know, it needs to move together. Uh, you know, you're so, so much in reliance on the people next to you. Um, and, um, and, and so much of it, maybe even more than the firing is the, is the drilling and being able to move together without a lot of confusion. Uh, you know, um, and, um, speaking of old lusty, as I, as I, um, told you that I went recently to the reenactment this past weekend, uh, one regiment, the eighth USCT, um, there's a story that they took the field in that battle of Olusty and didn't know how to fire their weapons. That's not really true. Um, company K was the company of that regiment that was not really prepared, uh, but it's remembered as the entire regiment. And I, and I guess um, it becomes one of those stories of, well, here's another example of, of, of the discrimination shown towards uh, black soldiers, but yet, Many soldiers, as you pointed out, with your ancestor and such, really um, didn't have much preparation. Mm -hmm. You know, across the board, 
white regiments or black regiments or whatever. Um, it's not basic training or anything like that. It's, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Joe, thank you for this in the in the chat. There's some more regiments like that. 175th at 183rd Ohio, 44th Missouri had day, just days before Franklin. Some soldiers have been in the Army for just over two weeks. So, yeah, this is getting to be a a thing with that. And uh, my buddy Dan Casella, how, how are you doing, Dan? Is there any evidence of monetary incentive for white officers to join USCT company or regimental positions? Absolutely. Um, but uh, the Bureau of, Color, Bureau of Colored Troops was created in May of 1863. Uh, and, and they were looking for white officers uh, who were also about character, who had the character to command black troops uh, and not just those who are trying to um, make more money. Um, Excuse me. Um, uh, so it's kind of a, a twofold thing. Um, now there were racist officers. Uh, there's a there's a letter from the sixth uh, USCT uh, soldier who's identified as bought and sold, didn't record his name, and he talks about uh, racist officers who who really were not on their side. Um, but uh, just going back to the question, um, yes, there were men in white regiments who, um, to become an officer, to make more money, um, but not just even officers, non-commissioned officers. There were some white non-commissioned officers in the USCT. Hmm. Um, I don't know how many. Uh, there is a, there's a book um, called They Have Left Us Here to Die, which is the, based on the prison diary of a, of a, a Sergeant Lyle, Lyle Adair. Uh, first Sergeant Lyle Adair of the um, of the 111th USCT. Uh, Lyle Adair had been with the 82nd Ohio before joining the 111th. So he's a white soldier. And what what blows my mind is is that he went up one rank as a non-com from a sergeant to a first sergeant. That's the with the the diamond, um, you know, in in the uh, cradle of the chevrons uh -huh. um, just to get that much more money. So he's not becoming a lieutenant or anything like that. Um, now, now some guys did. Uh, I know and one was a sergeant major who later became a, uh, a you know, a commissioned officer. But but that's just so wild um, that somebody has a sergeant in, a white sergeant in the USCT regiment. And, and that's also in part because um, uh, the non-commissioned officers, corporals and sergeants had to be literate men. So again, I don't know how many were uh, uh, white off white white guys who were sergeants and such, but um, there definitely were. Wow, Brian, you were talking about meeting that need to meet those quotas uh, by the state and and those who fell short and those who made it over. Taking someone from let's say Massachusetts and and saying, okay, we have to raise this many men for this company. Go out and find these men. Are they sent with? Uh, financial backing as far as like, hey, we're going to pay a bounty for you to come and fight in this Massachusetts regiment or this New York regiment, or are they just sent out to see if they can find recruits uh, overall in general? Um, I'm not sure. Um, but as the war goes on, um, you definitely need more incentives to get men to enlist. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would, I, my gut says yes uh but i can't i can't say for certain um and there's also the question of of you know when did uh this kind of recruiting start um uh during the war um i think i've seen some dates on um on some of that but i i um looking at the slide these all show men i'm looking at the the men from credited to Massachusetts in my other screen here. And these are all 60, 63, 64. Um, by that time, of course, there's a draft. By that time, of course, there's there's bounties. So I I'm I would put money on it, uh, pardon the pun, that <laughs> yes, they were sent out with uh, some kind of signing bonus, you know, mm -hmm. to get men to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that, that would be 
that'd be interesting to think that they're going out and being like, okay, you're going to Pennsylvania to find someone to fight for New York or Vermont or something. It's almost like you'd have to give them like a small bounty or something to go and do that. But you never know. I mean, it could just be, it just could be the fervor of the moment, uh, especially after a great loss or something Uh, like there are recruitment drives just before Sharpsburg Antietam and such that draws people in for new nine month regiments. I was, that's a interesting thought to ponder. And that's why, you know, you talk about, you don't know everything about the subject. Well, none of us know everything about whatever subject we're talking about. We're, we're lifelong, we're lifelong students and that's what makes it a beautiful thing, you know? Yeah. And uh, I think we have to keep reminding others that they are also lifelong students in some aspects, but uh, especially with enlistment and, and draftees, uh, when we when we think of the Civil War draft, we usually think about just the draft riots, uh, because that's what was in the the Ken Burns series and other popular history things that we have watched over the years. We don't think about where these men were plugged in to different units as far as the company level is concerned, or mm-hmm. entire regiments being formed, kind of morphed out of uh, nine month regiments that kind of fell by the wayside. Right. And then uh, their enlistments ran out and they have to plug in new men with draftees as far as like a company L, like you say, or something. Is that, is that what we're seeing more in like the overland campaign and into 65 is we still have some of the old guys, the, the OGs, if you will, the original guys have been on for three years, but then we're starting to see these kind of, uh, morphed kind of regiments where it's a mix or or yeah. what are we at least in the federal army and the u.s army what are we seeing there um yeah you're 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 uh definitely seeing that mix as i pointed out within a regiment within various companies can can have different makeups um uh but um you're also seeing not just that you're also seeing um men mustering out keep in mind uh, the first call for three-year vol- volunteers, first call for three-year men, comes in 1861. Mm-hmm. Um, and by the way, most men who served in the Civil War served for three years. Uh, so by 64, a lot of those men are are leaving um, the Army. What is it? Uh, I wrote this down earlier. Um, I think the uh, uh, these men start mustering out. I think it's like in during that summer, those summer campaigns, um, overland campaign. So, and they'll have to be replaced. Of course, um, by that time, it's, it's a lot of the draftees or some of the regiments you might see on some flags, um, where it says veteran volunteer infantry. Um, Mm -hmm. so they have that distinction of, you know, not just being, I volunteered as opposed to being drafted, but also they were veterans. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was a really proud distinction on their part. Um, uh, so yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Was it, was it different in the Confederate army? Because I've heard of men signing on and then all of a sudden they're being told you're in for the duration, you know, they're kind of getting a curveball thrown to them. Was it a little bit different in that regard? And in, in short, as they say, when the Confederate army got you in a uniform, you didn't get out. <laughs> um, it, you know, I'm, I don't believe it was obviously uh, planned for that. Mm-hmm. But um, the Confederacy had such a shortage of everything. Uh, I, I did discover that um, some men got out. Um, there were some men who were discharged in November 1861 because they um, signed for six months. So I thought it was kind of cool mm-hmm. that, you know, hey, there was a some Confederate uh, men who, who served and, and, you know, completed their enlistment and went home. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, you know, the ones who enlisted in, in April 1861 for a year, and then there were some laters who enlisted, I believe, for three years uh, later in 1861, like a month or so later. Uh, by the time those men who were, um, their enlistments were just about up in April 62, that's when the War Department pulled a fast one on them and said, no, you're going to have to stay in. And And that really, that, by the way, that spring of 1862, um, I, I believe, uh, as, as Gary Gallagher has pointed out, that uh, the Confederacy really was on the ropes. That's when um, a bu- bunch of men are going to be discharged unless something is done. Um, 
you know, four ten million dollars. Donaldson have fallen after Shiloh, and you know things are pretty desperate. So they do resort to this draft. Uh, again, the conscription forcing all men to serve. Later conscription acts are the ones that include the the twenty Negro law to to uh, um, for those who have twenty enslaved men that they are exempt. A whole bunch of occupations are exempt, but most men. Uh, are forced to serve. Hmm. Um, Confederate Confederacy is not as free as some people think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's historical memory is is changed that for a lot of people, and and the primary sources give us a different sense of what that was like when when some people hear that the Confederacy had the first draft and not the U.S. Army, they can't believe it. And, and right. it's, but but the North was drafting already. Uh, in 62, not before the draft riot. Mm. Um, they were drafting at the state level, and there were riots uh, in the Midwest, uh, you know, in different places of, of forcing men to serve. Um, again, go back to that, uh, what I said before about nobody knows how this is going to end. Nobody knew, predicted that the war was going to last four years and have all these casualties. Um, we, we also talked, too, about, uh, you know, you can watch a demonstration on what like a mini ball does to you, you know, the whole thing it shatters your bone and stuff like that. Uh, you have to take off your arm. We can talk about that all the time and see a demonstration on it, but they saw this, they, they smelt it. They felt it. They, they, they saw it up close in, 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 in 3d or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and for that regard, things like that regard, I mean, war that can have a serious effect on war fever. Um, Again, with the, the the black soldiers, uh, you know, at the beginning of the war, men wanted to serve, were refused. But then under the, under the conditions of you'll be paid less, you could be enslaved or enslaved for the first time. Many of those men, uh, black men, chose not, didn't want to serve. It, it, it blows my mind that so many people are shocked that there were black soldiers who were drafted, who also were substitutes. I don't know why people... Uh, I guess it's because of the cause of slavery or whatever. They think all black men were volunteers. They weren't, not at all. Mm. I, I, I think we actually had that question in the comments and I didn't get to it, where it was uh, something to the effect of were there, I'm sorry, I can't find it right now. Uh, were there men in the USCT who were drafted? And we kind of, we alluded to that several times, but that is a thing that many people probably have never uh, heard before or read a lot about is the, the draftee focus on the African-American experience. It's usually seen as a white uh, 1863, early 1863, early late 62 kind of thing, not understanding that there is the African-American component to that as well, like you've pointed out. Yeah. Um, there's um. For everybody who's seen Glory, if you can go on YouTube and uh, it's the documentary, it's called The True Story of Glory Continues. Um, it's narrated by Morgan Freeman. It includes outtakes of, uh, of the movie because they, they filmed like twice as much filming as they actually showed in the theater. Anyway, um, there's a great scene where Frederick Douglass is in Syracuse, New York on a recruitment drive and he is speaking to a crowd and one man um, protests and he says, Mr. Douglass, you know, my name is Joseph Williams. I own a family and a business. I have a family and a business. Um, I'm not going to give that up. You know, I'll give you some money. I'll support you in other ways, but I'm not going to join the army. And I, I don't know that I blame him for that. Um, I, I think he's he's called a coward or, or or something, which I think is just really uh, unfortunate. Because keep in mind, I mean, it's a for a black man to be uh, uh, have his own bu business and have his family together in the 19th century during a time of slavery is, is no small feat. Mm -hmm. um, and to put that at risk and to be paid less. Um, a lot of men, there were men who deserted because, uh, or didn't want to serve too, because they had um, their own occupations. I mean, um, uh, men in the North who, um, um, you know, had, a, we found a lot of barbers, for instance, or or whatever shopkeepers or whatever it is, uh, if they were making more money, they um, might hesitate before enlisting. Um, so yeah, 
Yeah, that makes makes a lot of sense. Uh, Joe has uh, one last point here. I'd like to point out before we log off later this evening. Uh, I wonder what the breakdown be for freedmen or formerly enslaved men in the North that were drafted compared to enslaved or formerly enslaved men from the South would be. That seems like an, a really interesting study if we could find those <laughs> those numbers. Let's see if there's a disparity. Um, that 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 would be very interesting. I know. Most USCT uh, regiments, I think, are from either Kentucky or Missouri, Mississippi, and, I, and Louisiana, I think, Louisiana and Kentucky, uh, and I think actually Kentucky. But um, those places, of course, being uh, places of, of, of slavery, uh, and then you have you know regiments like uh, out of Pennsylvania, the the third, the sixth, uh, um, and those. Um, so. Um, I don't know that I've seen, I take that back. I think that there are numbers, um, but did you have regiments where you had both together, formerly enslaved men who, you know, made it to say the third USCT out of Philadelphia with men who were, uh, had been free. In other words, uh, was that aspect of glory true? Um, I, I don't know. Um, I'm sure it happened somewhere but I, I don't know about that necessarily. It wasn't really true in the case of the, of the movie, uh, of, of the 54th. The 54th that's depicted in the movie is really a composite of many different um, uh, soldier experiences in the war. Hmm. That's a, that's still a good movie. Story. Yeah. Still a good movie. Yeah. Just... <laughs> it's still my personal top Civil War movie, but that's just me. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's mine too. And it really, I guess the sad part is, is that um I I wish, I hope that, you know, I'd love to see a movie like say on New Market Heights. That's a mm. great story. That's the one where like, you know, um uh, 15 uh uh black soldiers are awarded the Medal of Honor. If that's not a movie, I don't know what is. Yeah. But I, I certainly hope um and we need a new Civil War movie. We just do. Uh, I mm -hmm. hope something could be told. That would be a great story to tell. Uh, and there's, I'm sure there's many others um, that we could make movies out of. Um, yeah. 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 That, we do, we do need that. I mean, we had the Lincoln movie, which was, you know, a civil war movie, but it'd be great to have something uh, different out there for the world to see and pique this curiosity about the soldier experience in a new way, much like it piqued our curiosity with glory or Gettysburg or, or something like that, you know, again. Yeah. Uh, real quick. Um, um, yeah. I know you mentioned, since we talked about glory, the scene where, um, after the first battle in James Island, Shaw meets with Tripp and, and, and talks about carrying the colors, Tripp refuses. I really wonder if a soldier during the war would have refused like that. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, where he asked the questions, well, what happens after the war? What do we get when, when, when Tripp asks those questions? And then in the Lincoln movie with Daniel Day-Lewis, it, it opens up where uh, uh, black soldiers are seen having a conversation with Lincoln. First time, to my knowledge, that ever took place in a film uh, where you have a, a, a hmm. black soldier or somebody having a conversation with Lincoln like that. Anyway, um, I feel it's kind of a sequel to that scene in Glory because he takes it further and says, okay, it's January 1865. I think it's pretty much understood we're going to win. It's after that last turning point, I think, of, of the November election where Lincoln wins. And then um, he just says, okay, well, what we're going to win. So then what's going to happen to Black people in this country? You know, uh, and he lays out the whole thing of, you know, giving uh, uh, promotions to officers, the vote maybe in 100 years kind of predicts the future there. Um, but it's a great scene. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a powerful scene, yeah. And I never thought of it as a extension of that scene from Glory in that way. That's a that's a good way to put it. I right. I love that's I love my, the part that's, one scenes, I mean, that's one of my favorite scenes in Glory. Right. And, well, I love the part too where um uh, I think his name was Ira uh, Ira Clark, the the, the cavalryman, the black cavalryman, where he the the other two white soldiers start reciting the Gettysburg Address, and then they all have to leave, and then he finishes it and he shows. I heard your words. I heard your words too. I'm in your army and I'm fighting to, to save this country. I'm also fighting for my own rights. Um, 
I think he very much had the right to ask Lincoln those questions. Again, it's a fictional scene, but I think it's a great scene, and it's it's one of the really more powerful scenes in, in Civil War films. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree. Brian, I appreciate your time so much coming on tonight and talking with us about enlistments and draftees and substitutes. It's a, it's a thing where we just scratched the surface and there's so much more to, to uncover and uh, so much more to learn. And we really appreciate you coming on tonight and giving us an introduction and a, and a great background to this important subject. Well, thanks for having me, John. It's really uh, great to be here tonight. Great to talk to you as always. Uh, I really appreciated it. And, um, um, like I said, you know, still learning things um, and hope to talk to you again someday. Absolutely, Brian. You can come on anytime you want. You're you're a great historian and a good friend, and I really appreciate you being here and uh, giving us your insights on this. Uh, everybody in the chat, thank you so much for all the questions, the comments, uh, whether you're on YouTube, Facebook, uh, Twitter. I know you can't give us comments, but thank you for watching on Twitter as well. Uh, we appreciate all of you hanging out with us this evening and listening to this important subject. Please be good, uh, be well, be safe, keep reading, and we will all chat with you very soon. Take care, everybody. Good night, everybody.